Are we ready? Okay. Uh, welcome to the May 23rd meeting of the Glendale Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Morgan. Here. Commissioner Shire. Here. Commissioner Tufankian. Here. Commissioner Vartanian. Here. And Chairperson uh, Vidor. Here. Uh, the agenda for this meeting was posted on or before Tuesday, May 19th, 2011, on the bulletin board outside of City Hall. And uh, we will go right into item number three, which is uh, commission transitions. Um, my first order of business is to say a farewell to our former chair, Mr. Vrej Mardian. And I would like Vrej to please come up to the podium. Um, because on behalf of the commission, I am going to come right over to him and read, uh, take the time to read the proclamation. Thank you him. very much. No way out, over there. <laughs> So, whereas Vrej Mardian has completed six years of continuous service to the City of Glendale as a member of the Historic Preservation Commission from 2005 until 2011, serving as chair twice during that time, and whereas his unselfish contribution of his personal time, energy, and knowledge of the City's history, including arranging for and participating in educational outreach programs in the community, has promoted widespread respect for the objectives of the city's historic preservation efforts, and whereas Mr. Mardian has demonstrated strong and continuing interest in solving the many and varied problems before the commission for the purpose of improving the welfare of the citizens and the protection of the city's heritage, and whereas his work for the commission, including helping develop a new historic district ordinance and design guidelines, which allowed three historic districts to be designated during his tenure and three more to enter into the designation process, and whereas on behalf of the commission and the city, Mr. Mardian traveled to Michigan at his own expense to accept the National Alliance of Preservation Commission's awards for best practices and protection given to the commission for its efforts to identify and protect historic districts and bringing national attention to its work. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Historic Preservation Commission of the City of Glendale that the Commission extends to Vrij Mardian its sincere appreciation for the years of service so generally given. And I'm going to miss you very much on the Commission, Mr. Mardian. Uh, I really respect your technical expertise and your willingness to dig deep into things and to do a lot of due diligence before you make decisions. And I wish you all the best and we hope to see you. We hope to have you visit us soon for some reason. Anyway, on behalf of the commission. Thank you. And feel free to. Thank you very much. I must say it's been a great journey for six years. Uh, created a passion. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you very much all the commissioners and the past commissioners and staff who has worked with this commission diligently and we've come a long way, I must say. When I started on this commission, we didn't have anything set in concrete. Now our, this commission has grown strong. When I first joined the commission, and they tell me, oh, you're serving on the Hysterical Commission, but I said, no, it's <laughs> Historical Commission, and you see us uh, persevere. And we've come a long way, I must say, and due to all past and present commissioners and community members, uh, which, uh, you know, makes this city what it is today. And I'll leave with a positive note, and I just hope you continue your passion and preservation. And to make this commission even further stronger uh, and hope to see you again. But I'll be back uh, if I see something not right now. <laughs> we know you will. Because uh, I know the guidelines pretty well. I know you do. <laughs> Inside Thank and you. out. Inside and out, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much again, and I appreciate your time in putting this on the agenda. And I must say this is the first time we've done this. Uh, farewell for commissioner. I wish we'd done this a long time ago because we had a lot of other commissioners who mm. put really their time and effort and energy 
to make this commission what it is today. Thank, Thank you again. You. We'll hope to see you Thank all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, so you very much. If anyone has any comments on the commission. Feel well, free. I, I would just like to thank you very much. You you made this commission such a professional commission. The, your direction and your passion, and you, your expertise on everything. I've I've learned so much in this last year. I, I can't say enough. But thank you for everything that you've done for all of us and for all of Glendale. Thank you. Yeah, I'd also like to say thank you so much for you. I think you brought a good balance to the code and building planning. Um, you know, kind of guidelines to historic preservation, a great balance, and your knowledge and expertise will be missed. Okay, well, thank, okay you thank you very much. And um, I would like to, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Did I miss anything here? Okay, I would like to welcome Lorna Vertanian uh, to the commission. Um, I know, have known Lorna for quite a while um, and know of her efforts on behalf of uh, preservation in the city of Glendale. And so on behalf of the commission, I'd like to say welcome, Lorna. We're looking forward to working with you and having you on the team. And if anyone else would like to make a comment, please feel free. And we, of course, love to hear from you. Thank you. Well, it's actually an honor for me to be joining this commission. Um, Mr. Mardian, I would have enjoyed serving with you. And I recognize that I have some very large shoes to fill. Um, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the confidence. And I'd also like to thank the City Council for their confidence in appointing me. And I very much look forward to carrying on the efforts that were begun by those before me and that have been carried on by those of you on the dais right now. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lorna. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay. And now we go on to, um, I, I guess, I, pardon? Oh. Go ahead. Uh, the next item is uh, commission vice chair, of it, which would be a vote to determine the vice chair of the commission. And just as a point of clarification, uh, in 2007, the commission adopted procedural rules which stated that the commission member with the most seniority by tenure on the commission, not by age, would be voted as the chairperson and that the commission would vote the next person, um, the next most senior member of the commission as vice chair. Since Mr. Mardian was serving as the past chair until uh, last month, and since he stepped down, the chair position turns to the vice chair under Mr. Mardian, which is Ms. Fedor. Um, but that leaves you without a vice chair. So the commission has the obligation of nominating and voting on a vice chair who will serve for the remainder of the year. Thanks so for just clarifying, clarifying the rules of uh, why they're voting of a chair well, is not right. on here. Why aren't we <laughs> nominating a chair? Um, okay. Well, we are nominating a vice chair, so I would like to entertain a nomination for a vice chairman of the commission. I would like to nominate Desiree Shire for vice chair for the Historic Preservation Commission. Do I have a second for? I uh, second that. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Morgan. Enthusiastically, yes. Commissioner Shire? Dane, I assume. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. Commissioner Tafankian? Yes. Commissioner Vartanian? Yes. And Chairperson Vidor? Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. We will all do our best. We presume this means you're willing to serve as Vice Chair. Yes. Shire. Thank you. Okay, now we go on to review of the minutes of the last meeting on April 25th. Um, so if anybody has any specific additions or corrections to the minutes, please uh, speak up. I feel like that's me. Yeah. It looked very good to me. Um, yeah. um, Spartanian, you'll be up abstaining, obviously, so we will... Um, entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the April 25th meeting. Anyone want to make that motion? I make the motion to approve the minutes as written for the uh, Monday, the April 25th, 2011 HPC meeting. Second? I second. All in favor? Uh, roll call. <laughs> Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Shire? Yes. Commissioner Tofankin? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Vartanian? Abstain. And Chairperson... Uh, the door. Yes. Okay. Oral communications. Uh, discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. 
and each speaker is limited to five minutes. The Commission may question the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision made. And I have one card, uh, Herbert Milano. Thank you very much, Chair Vidor, members of the Historic Preservation Commission, and staff. My name is Herbert Molano. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate Ms. Vertanian on your uh, nomination and for this position. Um, and I'd like to uh, present to you some ideas that I've had for quite some time. About six years ago, I began a, uh, an initiative to try to persuade the City Council to think of the Central Park area where the Adult Recreation Center is and the Central Library to consider a vision for that whole area in a way that could be a center for the whole city for all types of events and artistic uh, activities and so on. The, um, but as part of that vision uh, for which I had presented a, uh, a rendering of what it would look like, it had the Masonic Temple as one of its primary uh, uh, anchors of, of this park. The, um, during that period of time, the city had approved about $40,000 of facade improvement to the Royal Palace Banquet Hall. And I had presented the idea to some councilmen at the time to say, look, if you guys are willing to donate $40,000 for a banquet hall, why not spend a similar amount of money and, and convince perhaps the uh, Di Pietro brothers to see if you could do an enhancement and an improvement of, the, uh, of some of the deterioration that is taking place uh, of the Masonic Temple. If you pay close attention to it, the wood, you can see it is in a state of disrepair. It could really use some significant refurbishment. The, um, the stained glass is not real stained glass. It's, it's, if, if you notice carefully, it, it appears to be stained glass, but it isn't. Um, and the entryway just seemed too, um, um, uh, too commercial as opposed to, you know, with the, the things that they put on the outside of it. Now. I, I'm a strong supporter of the arts, and I really like the idea of having uh, a uh, the noise within and, and, and programs that would bring into the center of the city the kind of activities that are, tend to occur more up on uh, at Brand Park. In the center of the city, we're really devoid of that type of artistic activity. And I always had this vision that perhaps that the that the Masonic Temple could serve as an ideal place to have perhaps a like a library concert, a uh, chamber concert place. Um, there is, um, I was lucky enough when I was um, visiting uh, with my family in Venice, um, Italy, and uh, there was a program that I wanted to see of classical guitar. And when we walked into this hall, it was like libraries on the side, and then at the end of the stage, there was this amazing um, presentation of classical music, chamber music primarily. But then you had the rest of the, of the environment just, you know, exuding all this historical, you know, um, uh, paintings and, and, the, and the architecture that was so special. And I don't know if Glendale has a place like that, but I think if there is one, uh, it is my suggestion that we make really enhance the, the, the presence of the Masonic Temple as a major cultural historic center for the city and for this commission to take perhaps the initiative to see if we could, you know, participate. Because the city does obtain money from HUD for these purposes of facade enhancement. And perhaps some of that money could also be used to serve as a seed money to revitalize this, uh, this amazing building. Um, I go to Pasadena very often, and as you, you know, all aware, there's the whole experience is enhanced because all these old buildings were maintained in such an incredible, uh, they've done such a fantastic work. Redevelopment really partakes and puts the investment into creating a special place. And, uh, and I just don't see the same level of commitment in the center part of Glendale. And so that it was my hope that maybe as one of your agenda items for the future that you could consider looking at, at the Masonic Temple as a, a renewal for artistic and, and cultural uh, presentations, and perhaps put it in such an extent that it will invite other uh, uh, performance entities to use this place uh, as a center. And also, we have this incredible collection of Armenian historical books at the basement of the Central Library that I thought, why not see if the, P the Pietro brothers could be persuaded to 
have one of those floors, you know, to serve in that kind of capacity, a library chamber music. But I think that we start really in focusing on that part of Glendale to really create a, a, a cultural center. No better place than to have it, you know, our most notable, noted historic building other than the Alex to serve for that purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> you want to make a comment about the project that's uh, underway? or? Um, yes. The, um, as some of the members of the commission will recall, um, I forget exactly how long ago it was, but the Masonic Temple did come forward to the commission um, as it is a designated property for facade work, including uh, some of the kind of concerns Mr. Milano has brought up. Uh, as well as adding some new windows onto the north and south facades to accommodate light and to what are very large and dark spaces. They're originally assembly spaces associated with uh, um, with whatever events the, Mas the Masons had in the building in the brief period of time they occupied it. Um, the DePetro brothers who own the structure have ent entitled that project for the purposes of converting it into creative office space. That's uh, currently how they're planning on marketing the building. Um, they are interested in some retail space on the ground floor. Um, but the commission has reviewed those plans have, and has approved them. It's my understanding the Patriot Brothers have pulled their necessary building permits to start that work and have, in fact, started cleaning up the interior of the building and starting doing some of the interior demolition prep work. Um, so that's the current status of the Masonic Temple. Thank you very much. And thank oh, you for it, your it, comments. And if I may, I will also note um, uh, the. The speaker also alluded to a facade grant program. In the redevelopment project areas, we do have a facade grant program uh, that is a matching grant program um, for properties, all properties in, in redevelopment project areas. Um, but the number, of, and I always forget the exact numbers, um, is a little bit higher, not necessarily a matching grant with historic designated properties. Uh, at this point in time, I'm not sure if the owners of Masonic Temple are planning on taking advantage of that, but they certainly would be eligible to use facade grant money to offset some of the costs of their project. Right, and I, I think we all would agree we'd certainly hope that they would take advantage of that program. Yeah, uh, for example, the Sealy's building, on the, in, which is in the San Fernando Road project area, it's obviously outside of the downtown, um, that project is planning on applying for the facade grant. Um, money as part of the project that they're doing to renovate that building. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Comments from commissioners. So this is just general comments or updates or a status of something, whatever you want to comment on. So maybe we'll start on that side and work our way this way. Well, I, one, I would like to, Commissioner Fartani and I would like to welcome her to the commissioner herself. I've known her for many years and she's one of the best people in Glendale as far as of historic preservation and um, just getting things done and she's motivated and um, we're just incredibly lucky to have her on our commission so I just like to welcome her personally. Thank you very much for the warm welcome I, I really do appreciate it. Just have one, one brief comment I just wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, the Glendale Historic Society for a great event on April 30th the Taste of Spain, it was at one of the residences on Royal and well attended and very well executed. Okay, first of all, I'd like to welcome you to the, Thank to the you. board. Thank you for um, serving. And also, I would like to mention that the California Presentation Foundation had a four-day seminar in Santa Monica this past weekend, and I attended two of the four days, and it was very informative. They had workshops, tours, lectures, and I would urge anybody who's interested in preservation to check out their uh, website. It is California www CaliforniaPresentation.org for any future lectures or conferences that they might have. And I believe that it alternates between Southern California and Northern California every other year. So um, I think that's a very good resource. Thank you. I don't think I have any comments at the moment. Okay. Um, well, I have kind of an extended comment. Um, I would like today to ask the Commission to allow us to adjourn the meeting in memory of Eldon Davis, uh, who died recently, uh, born in 1917. Uh, Eldon da Davis is 
uh, half of the incredibly well-known team of Arnett and Davis. Um, and for those of us who like modernism and space age googie architecture, Arnett and Davis are two of the giants of the Southern California whimsical crazy coffee house. Um, a couple of their their greatest um, projects in Southern California that you may recognize are Pan's uh, Diner, which is near the airport, and of course Norm's with its famous signage. Uh, and also um, they have a couple things they did in Glendale. Uh, some of you remember on San Fernando Road what used to be Patrick's. Well, originally it was a Denny's, and then it was Patrick's, and now it's the Corner Bistro. Uh, that is a uh, Arnett and Davis project, and the uh, Glen Capri Hotel, which is quite a modernist landmark and has also been the topic of a lot of filming in the movie industry, is also an Arnett and Davis uh, project. So I just wanted to mention the passing uh, of that half of a great team, and we will adjourn the meeting if everybody agrees in memory of Mr. Davis. Any great. comments? Okay. Great. So now we're on to old business, and that is our list of consideration of commissioner-generated proposals for future discussion regarding HPC policies and goals. And I think we all have our ongoing list of topics of discussion that we've either completed or that we will be discussing in the future. So I would like to ask if any of the commissioners would like to add anything or bring anything into the agenda is something for the future. Today we are going to discuss one of the issues that we put on the table, but um, there are others that we still haven't gotten to yet. So um, I think, do we have any that have not been seconded into agenda uh, status no. yet? No. Okay, everything is queued up for agenda right. then. Okay. Just as a reminder to the commission, this list we'll be providing with your agenda packets. Just. It's an ongoing thing, and if you have something, an issue you'd like to put on the table, mm -hmm. this would be the time to do it. Uh, if not, then we'll just keep working on it until we get through them. Okay. So. I think we've made a lot of progress in clarif clarifying things. Um, so if we're completed on that item, why don't we go on to new business? So the first order of business is the consideration of 804 West Kenneth Road for the Glendale Register and as uh, for a Mills Act application. So, um, uh, Mr. Duong, if you'd like to proceed with your report. Good afternoon, Chair Madam uh, Vidor, Commissioner, and welcome, Commissioner Waltonian. The subject, the property owners are requesting for the subject property to be considered for, <coughs> excuse me, for listing on the Glendale Register of Historic Resources and to enter into a Mills Act contract with the city. Based on the site visit and documents submitted with the application, the subject property appears to be eligible under criteria C and D, which are for a significant person tied to the property and for its exceptional design. 804 West Kenneth Road was built in 1928 on an, an expansive rectangular lot located at the su southwest corner of West Kenneth Road and Highland Avenue in what is known as the Cumberland Heights neighborhood located in northwest Glendale. Uh, criteria C ad, uh, is identified with a person who significantly contributed to the history and development of the city, while criteria, Criterion D is for the architectural design, detail, materials, or craftsmanship of a particular period. This is a front view of the subject property. The original owner, John F. Stanford, commissioned Earl C. Ron to design the Spanish colonial revival style residence. Mr. Stanford, however, built the house himself. John F. Stanford was born in Tennessee on August 8, 1877. He began his construction, financing, and real estate business, which was based in Glendale in 1910. 
Mr. Sanford was a prominent figure in the city during that time. He was well known in the community for offering easy financing for home buyers and was credited with much of the city's growth and development during its early years. It was believed that his company constructed over 500 homes within, its, within the first 15 years. His wife, Anna P. Stanford, was born on September 13, 1878. Together they had four children. In 1929, the eldest daughter, Mildred, married a Pasadena man, which took place at the 804 West Kenneth Road property. The wedding was a big social event that year. The Stanford, however, lived in the house for only two years before selling it in 1931. By 1941, he and his wife left the local area. <coughs> Numerous owners have owned the property. The current owners purchased the property in 1994. Little is known about the architect Earl C. Ron. He was, however, he was born in Chicago on April 1st, 1904. And while in Los Angeles, he worked for a num number of architectural firms, including Taylor & Taylor, and J.A. Kiefer. He also worked on his own commissions and is credited with design and plans for several post-World War II housing tracts in West Los Angeles. This is another view of the house taken from the front. The subject property so showcases an exemplary representative of the Spanish colonial revival style. This style was popular throughout Glendale in the 1920s and 1930s. The resident also shows some influences of the Mediter Mediterranean Revival architecture. For instance, notice the sym symmetry located at the front entry here. You have the arch entry with four windows of the same size, tall, skinny windows, and two round windows with de decorative wrought iron over them, as well as two light fixtures. So this is typical of the Mediterranean Revival, however, it, this feature is atypical in the Spanish colonial revival style home. The house is configured on two levels, measuring about 60 by 70 feet, and is U-shaped in plan view, containing a courtyard that is linked to the pool, an outdoor bar, and tennis court. The house is about 5,830 square feet, containing five bedrooms, five bathrooms, as well as a partial basement and a maid's quarter under the garage. The three-car garage is detached and located at the rear of the property. The, the garage contains a storage pantry room as well as a laundry room. A, a, dry, a drying garden is located directly behind the garage. The Stanford House contains numerous character-defining features representative of the Spanish colonial revival architecture. For example, the roof is low pitch, clad in two-piece bell tile, open eaves all around the residence with exposed rafter tails, smooth stucco finish for exterior walls, wood casement windows and French door throughout, and a balcony at the front supported by wood brackets, carved balusters, and turned columns. The front entry as I stated earlier, it's recessed inside a deep arched opening with a decorative wrought iron gate. And the front chimney have ceramic chimney pots. Actually, both chimneys, the front and the rear. Other decorative elements include wrought iron window grills, the light fixtures you see, an example here, by the entry, iron gates on both sides of the house, as well as stucco grills in a grid pattern. The house also features, actually, this is a driveway. Notice the um, original concrete driveway that leads to the garage at the rear through a covered portal cashier. <coughs> this is a view of the rear of the property. Uh, Featuring, the, uh, you can see the courtyard, and in front of the courtyard or behind the courtyard, uh, beyond the benches and the tables here, is the pool as well as the tennis court. Tennis court, and 
an outdoor bar. This is a view of the other side of the same courtyard. And here is a stained glass window, which is original to the house. This window faces the rear. Uh, if you recall, there are a number of stained glass windows that are found on the house, particularly on the smaller windows, such as this one over here. And I believe this is a bathroom windows. The other stained glass windows are not original to the house. This is the only one. This is actually um, the entry area uh, going up the stairs. Eight hundred four West Kenneth Road lies within the two thousand and four Cumberland Heights Historic Survey that was done. Uh, this property was given the status code of. 5B, meaning it was found individually eligible for the Glendale Register as well as a contributing structure in the historic district that, is, that was identified in that survey. There have been a number of alterations to the property, but overall these changes do not appear to um, modify or affect the exterior appearance of the residents. A new kitchen window was installed, and that was, that, this is the window right here. This is the only non-original windows that's uh, found on the house. The applicant, the property owner, did her best in trying to match the existing style and material as the existing windows. Here, the one, this picture on the top right is the original windows, and this is a close-up of the stained glass. Forced air heating and cooling were installed in 1973. There was a bathroom remodel that was done inside. There was a creation of a sitting room by eliminating a bathroom. Chimney repair and the installation or construction of the swimming pool and tennis court. Those two items were added in the early, early 1980s. And of course the, the non-original stained glass windows. Overall, as I stated earlier, uh, these changes do not appear to um, impact the residents, and the house appears to maintain a high level of architectural integrity. Here are more photos of uh, the property. This is actually a side entry on the western portion of the uh, on the eastern portion of the property, this door actually opens to another open courtyard-like area. And there's a fountain here, but that is non-functional. And on the steps and risers, landings of, the, of uh, these stairs, you'll find decorative tiles throughout. And this picture here on the bottom uh, right-hand side is uh, the drying garden, located behind the garage and the laundry room. So uh, criteria, let me just go over some of the main points for um, in reviewing this application, staff believe that the subject property uh, meets two criteria, again criteria, criterion C and criterion D. Criterion C, as I stated earlier, is associated with the builder and the original owner, John F. Stanford. As previously noted, Mr. Stanford was a well-known developer and financier during the city early history. He is credited with the development of the city and its growth. Criterion D pertains to the architectural style of the resident. We believe the property showcases the best remaining architectural style, in this case, the Spanish colonial revival uh, architecture due to its um, features, its character-defining uh, features, as well as uh, the high level of architectural integrity. So, On the application, the property owner also suggests that this property may meet criteria A, F, and G. However, upon further review, uh, staff could not support those findings. Um, finding A 
had to do with um, would have to be identified, the subject property would have to be identified with a specific singular aspect or aspects of contributing to the city's heritage, such as Leslie Brand and the Brand Library or the, the R. Devine property. And criterion F would, is typically associated with archaeological uh, remains. This area or this site in general is pretty much developed and extensively, so any remains that may have existed would have been discovered or unearthed. And criterion G requires that the proposed resource contain a natural setting that strongly contributes to the well-being of the people of Glendale. 804 West Kenneth Road is a large, beautiful landscape property, but if its feature is design, it's a, a design landscape rather than a more natural setting. Therefore, we believe it most definitely meet criteria C and D, however, A, F, and G um, are not eligible. Overall, staff recommends approval of um, this property to be listed on the Glendale Register as well as uh, the Mills Act contract. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Duong. Does um, uh, anybody have a question or need any clarification on the staff report? I okay. just have, oh, go ahead. I have go a quick ahead. question on um, the Cumberland Heights. The Lombardi House, is, does that fall within the Cumberland Heights area? I believe that it does. I forget the exact address. Of it's the, like 800 Cumberland? Yeah, it, Do you have it? Yeah, Cumberland. Okay. I believe that it probably would. The, the original Cumberland Heights survey was quite extensive. It was big. Okay. Okay, if there aren't any other comments, we can open up the public hearing now. I know that the owner of the home is here, and have you filled out a card to speak? Okay, well, that's all right. You can just do that before you leave, but uh, please, we'd like to hear from you. State Great. your name. I'm April falzon Garen, and thank you for having me here. Um, my first time here actually but um, and thank you for considering uh, my home at 804 West Kenneth for the Glendale Register and the Mills Act we have lived in the home since 1994 and what we fell in the reason we fell in love with this home was because of this incredible architecture um, I lived in Mexico as a child. My husband was born in Mexico. It just really resonated with us. Uh, when the Cumberland Heights Historical uh, Evaluation was being made, we were, we were on board. We were hoping that would go through, and hopefully eventually it will one day. We have not only, and we've done quite a bit of, when we bought the home, it was in a great deal of despair and, and deferred maintenance and but anything we've ever done to the house to even restore it was to maintain not only the integrity of the architecture on the outside but to also maintain the integrity of the architecture and elements on the inside and we've done so quite well other than what had been done before in any kind of remodeling efforts we um, I just happened to run across a couple days ago through going through some paperwork a flyer on the Lombardi house and I must have gone through the house at one time and I do recall it but uh, attached to it was a biography of the house by Tim Ger Gregory on the Lombardi house and I really took a close look and said oh my goodness they were developed by the same developer and most likely designed by the same architect and then I'm looking at these pictures, and it's amazing how many elements are identical, not just like, but identical to the elements in our home, both interior and exterior. And it's just such a special home that I would hate for it to ever, and it could be tomorrow, it could be in 10, 20, 30, anyone to ever do anything to this property that could ever take away from the integrity of its architecture. It's just been, it's a very special home with really such bones and 
soul, I like to say, that can really cannot be replaced today, and it would be a crime to to have anything happen to that, and that's why I hope you consider it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Mrs. Guerin or want any more information? Okay, well, I think then um, we close the public hearing now and go into discussion and then proceed to a vote. So why don't we start the discussion? Who wants to start? I'll throw it open. Well, I'll start. <clears throat> I found that the house architecturally significant. It's a very, very interesting house. And it, 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 it's all of it. It's, it's so... Um, Nothing much has been changed on it. It's, I find, though, that there's a lot of, uh, I'm not sure when the Lombardi House was built and nominated, but it, there's a lot of uh, interesting things that are, are, are pretty much the same as the Lombardi House that are, are then in this house. I find that Mr. Stanford, I did some research on him, and he definitely is one of the original developers in Glendale. Um, I think it's significant because he owned the house, he built the house. I think it's... Uh, it's great the simple fact that it has not been altered in all of these years. It's pretty much as Mr. Stanford envisioned it, other than the fact that there is now a pool and a uh, tennis courts where there used to be citrus groves. But it's um, you definitely get a feel when you're walking around the building itself. So I'd like to leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to jump in? I will. Okay. Um, I really enjoyed your house. Thank you so much for opening it up to us. Um, it's just a beautiful example of Spanish colonial. I love the, um, as staff pointed out, the very symmetrical entrance with very asymmetrical balance on both sides from the balcony on the upper right to the chimney on the left. I mean, it's just beautiful how the front facade really balances out. Um, I also found interesting, you really have kind of two formal entries to the house, one off the side courtyard and fountain area and one off at the front. and. Just beautiful architecture all the way around, so I really appreciate you bringing this forward to us for consideration. Um, I definitely would support it going forward. I have a few comments regarding Mills Act, just considerations for us to discuss. Uh, I noticed two things. One, I think it would be great if the fountain could be functional, especially being that that's such a formal kind of entrance off the side as a secondary uh, entrance, so that would be a consideration. Maybe we would tie that in with the Mills contract. Uh, the second thing I noticed was um, just two metal awnings, probably 60s-ish, 70s era. Not noticeable at all from the street, from the uh, very west elevation, over I think the back kind of entrance to maybe kitchen or porch. That at some point we might want to consider those as part of the Mills Act switching up because they do have beautiful... Metal ones? Yeah. Okay. I'm sure someone... <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, they're beautiful you know, canvas awnings, which are, to, you know, in keeping with the style, um, and the metal ones, you know, obviously take away a little bit, but not much, and they're on the most hidden elevation, so that would be something I think we could discuss if it's something we want to include for future, but, yeah, okay. beautiful, beautiful. Good points. Thank you. Well, I really enjoyed your home. It's a beautiful, beautiful home, and I've passed it many times, and it's always caught my eye. Um, I think it's a su superb representation of the um, Spanish colonial revival homes, and I believe um, you've maintained it very, very nicely. Um, regarding the awnings, um, I was just wondering, does it have, does it, give shade? Is it for shade? Does it get really hot inside? Is there if, a reason why? I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but if you would like to question the applicant, yes. the chair would have to reopen the hearing and ask you to oh. come back to the mic. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. And we can do that. We're reopening the hearing. I'm not sure why they were installed at the time. Um, we were thinking about removing it, but we thought Maybe it is for shade, and it is a staircase, and for rain or covering of some kind of reason that somebody installed it as to uh, to protect them from getting wet or maybe coming in or from the garage. We thought about removing them, and then we thought maybe it's significant. <laughs> They're right. older, and maybe we should keep them. So I'd have to really take a look at them to really 
see how functional they were. Yeah. And what the no, my is. just concern was to, uh, if if we were thinking of possibly removing, um, what are the consequences? Would it be too hot inside, or is it um, for protection from the rain and so on? So I think those it might be too. more for protection of the rain uh, right. that somebody install that. We didn't okay. do it, but as you said, more 60-ish, 70-ish, mm -hmm. so maybe that's the purpose. I haven't thought about it, but I must say it does, it does give a function. When it's raining, it's nice that when you're carrying groceries in. Yeah. Uh, you're not getting wet or no one's slipping, so it's keeping that upper area dry. Mm -hmm. er, thank you. Before we close the public hearing, I have a question. Yes. So before we go to your comments, uh, Commissioner Vartanian, I'll ask my question. Um, there's this very curious item in the drying garden that looks like, I don't know what the technical name is, but like a golf ball flinger. It's a washer. Wa oh, yeah. It's a golf so ball you know washer. I know about. Mm -hmm. And that was there when we got there. And that mm -hmm. looks like some kind of a, an original artifact from the Absolutely. Sanford days because he was a champion golfer, wasn't he? I didn't he? know that. Uh, so, so, most likely. I, you know, I don't know where we stand on Are you little suggesting it was a putting garden on a drying mm -hmm. garden? Putting garden. Or <laughs> I think it may have been yeah. a putting green yes. at one time. A little putting green. <laughs> because that's always With been there. With a clothesline. And we didn't, <laughs> we didn't remove it. We just didn't yeah. remove it. And is, is this type of thing something that can be or should be? I'm really asking a question in general here uh, because it's so unique and possibly even valuable and certainly certainly represents something meaningful about the owner. Is that something we'd ever want to consider or is it too trivial? Uh, no, I think you could absolutely consider that as, and highlight that as something that you think is a character feature of the property. Obviously, it's not part of the house, but certainly there have no, been other isn't. cases <laughs> where you've had very detailed discussions about stained glass windows and other what might be considered somewhat incidental details. But mm -hmm. Yeah, so that could okay. be part of your discussion. I just wanted to hear what the comment was on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you for your feeling that it's significant. We just always loved it. <laughs> Thought, what a unique, you know, and so we just kept it there. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Vontanian, your Thank comments? Thank you. Um, I also think this, there's tremendous architectural integrity in this home, and like Commissioner Shire, I um, really appreciate if we could possibly go back to the facade of the house. Um, both the, the articulation of the symmetry and the asymmetry of this facade incorporating the Spanish colonial revival and the Mediterranean elements, as Mr. Duong pointed out, the symmetry of the, um, the entry portal with the three lights on either side. I also really like the balance uh, that was mentioned on both sides with the vertical chimney on one side and you've got that lower angled roof jetting into it and your um, balcony with the overhang on the uh, east side. I, I just think it's a beautiful articulation. I also noticed there were lots of groupings of three, um, which I think are is sort of a, a, a classical, a number from classical architecture, especially in your triple arch, and it, it does also bring balance and harmony. There are three windows in the balcony. There are three windows um, on the lower level below the balcony. As you walk around to the Port Couchere, there are three beautiful parabolic arches. And as you walk through those three parabolic arches, you come upon the triple arch of the garage, um, which is echoed across the way in the upper arcade of the courtyard um, by the triple arches of the arcade. And so I think there was a lot of thought put into the design of this home and um, the harmony, the balance, um, I don't think we have a pool of the sec uh, a picture of the pool uh, looking back from the pool to the house, but again, you have three window openings articulated in the family room at the top and then three window openings at the basement below. Uh, so again, very harmonious throughout um, all sides of the home. I also noted the um, the stucco screens over several of the smaller windows, which I think add somewhat of a Moorish element to the home and give it a different texture and um, a different point of reference. Um, I noticed in the, um, in the history that was written up regarding the home that um, the county assessor at the time 
the home was reviewed gave the construction quality of the house a value of extra special even though apparently special was the highest grade that could be given at the time so I think that speaks also to the quality of the construction um, so I think with that um, I picked up a quote the Roman architect Vitruvius said that beauty and architecture should delight people and raise their spirits and I think this house does that for me so those are my comments okay. Thank you all. Um, I have a few comments. I'm going to speak to the criteria uh, upon which we make our evaluation and final decision. Um, with regard to your request to consider uh, criteria A, um, I, I think it's borderline, but I agree with staff that, um, you know, we're looking at homes like the two adobes, uh, Art Even, and the Brand Castle when we talk about the context of city heritage, and I don't think it, Mr. Stanford was obviously very important in the world of building during the big building boom, but I don't think uh, his contribution rises to the level of criteria A. Um, criteria C, absolutely, and I totally agree that the house should be named for him because not only was he a prominent builder, but he built this house and this was his house. So um, it's appropriate to name the house the Stanford House. Uh, criteria D, it certainly is one of the best examples architecturally, and I'll just echo everything that my fellow commissioners said. I particularly was delighted by those stucco grills with the windows in back of them. I've never seen anything like that before. The drying garden, very unusual. Um, and that old, I guess, original wrought iron drying line there was pretty strange and wonderful. Uh, I think the house, because of its grand street elevations on a prominent corner, just, you know, makes it kind of a grand um, house in the neighborhood, clearly one of the finest. So last remaining certainly qualifies. Um, and I think the chandelier in the back hanging from the back porch is a very fine feature that should be maintained in good condition and retained, um, and the parabolic port cochere, very unusual also. Um, so those are my comments about criteria D. Uh, criteria F, um, I think that if we have evidence of an archaeological, you know, when, when you dig down deep um, and you find something and there's evidence, then that particular requirement kicks in, but uh, in this case, no. And um, D and G, also I agree with city staff that that criteria doesn't uh, apply because it's a formally landscape, not a natural setting, but it does give rise to some questions which I'll defer for the discussion about how the landscape and hardscape in the back would or should be maintained. That's something that I want to include in the discussion. So I agree with the criteria. I think the House meets the ones that have been called out by staff extra specially. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for bringing the House to us. It's an honor to have it here for consideration. So with that, then do we go on to the discussion? At this point, um, and well, this make point, our decision. At this point, you could entertain a motion, and, but it sounds like there are a few items that the commissioners would like to discuss. Okay. Um, I'll let Mr. Duong sort of cover some of the specifics, but it sounds like we're ready also for a motion for because we're all kind of we've we've solved most of the questions. Okay, I will entertain a motion. And if I may, on this um, page four of the staff report very last paragraph recommended action by the HPC. Um, if the commission is inclined as it sounds to sort of uh, make the motion as recommended by staff, basically the motion would be starting at I move HPC and drop out the part where it says staff recommends that the HPC does such and such. So there's two two particular motions, one related to the designation, one to the Mills Act. So whoever would make the motion and can just read that language. Uh, Chair Pitar, I believe there's a few Items that I heard mentioned that we should just discuss. Discuss one. Absolutely. The name. Mm -hmm. um, one that you had mentioned the the little golf item drawing mm -hmm. potential metal awnings mm -hmm. or functioning fountain. Mm -hmm. If we want to tie any of those into 
the Mills Act contract. Oh, okay. I'd so like to have, hear from my fellow commissioners. On yes, I I would like to have those discussed to um, a point of order. Do we handle that now, yeah, or do we um, do the recommendation or our decision on the designation now and then go into the Mills Act? Uh, why don't we do the discussion of the particular the various items now? Because okay. that may or may not change everybody's somebody's mind about how they would vote on the nomination. Okay. All right, um, then so I will um, take comments uh, and discussion items. So would you like to start, um, Commissioner Shire? I've mentioned the few concerns that I have. I would like to hear from my fellow commissioners well, if there's any <coughs> concerns. Maybe on I, ag <coughs> I agree on the fountain. If the fountain could be made usable and serviceable, I think it is important for the integrity of the house. <coughs> I'm not sure on the awnings, they're behind the house, correct? They're they're, they're on, on the rear. They're on the west side. So when you go down the driveway to the triple car garage, they're on your so left. So they're observable. There were no photos that I. No, on the other side. Oh, it's too dark to see. It's no, it's on the the back entrance. But they are the observable street. from the street. Uh, no, probably not from the street. It's just as you look at this beautiful structure. If there's going to be Mills Act contract provided, my thoughts were. Obviously, that there needs to be future, you know, restoration, and the money is spent on that. It would be something that they could do in future years to match the awnings. That there are a substantial amount of awnings, canvas awnings, on the house. It'd be nice if they'd like those to have those match and not have it kind of be right, an okay. eyesore as far as awning goes. It is not visible from the street, I don't believe, because of the trees and kind of the hedging, and it is back past the Porcocher. So you probably can't really see them, but I believe there was maybe two on that side of the house, one large that goes over the uh, stairway entrance maybe to the kitchen. So basically you would like the other awnings as they're being replaced to, to Either mimic. Either could be removed or mimic the other awnings okay. as part of the mill's, not, not contingent on our approval here, but as part of the mill's contract, it could be something that they, okay. do within the two-year time frame that we allow or whatever we decide. That would be my recommendation. Thank you. Again, she doesn't come back up. We we can't really take anything from the floor unless you. We need to open the. That's okay. <laughs> um, all right, I'll go to this side of the aisle. Um, I think I do agree with the fountain. It would be great if the fountain was functionable. It would be nice to have. The, um, no, That's our own intention. Okay. Um, <coughs> I agree. Did, oh, did everybody get a chance to comment? Yes. yes. Okay, we have everybody. Um, I agree with the fountain also and with the awnings. They either would be removed or they should be consistent and of the period and appropriate to the architecture of the house. Um, a couple other things, the, you know, obviously this house can, you know, you may come back and want to do more to the house and I assume since the 1980s tennis court and swimming pool are 1980s features that they could easily be, um, not easily, of course there's always permitting and things that you have to get, but that they aren't even anything we're considering, and none of the landscaping and hardscaping that is associated with the landscaping is under consideration here either. Uh, well, actually, um, Ms. Vidor, any of that could be part of your consideration. Um, the, any part of the property is, the property itself is designated, not necessarily the structures. So um, anything that's on the property that's part of the historic character or tells the story of the house or it's kind of defining characteristics is certainly could be considered as part of being called out as part of the designation. Mm. Um, I'm not sure if you're inclined to designate the tennis court. No. Um, but it is part of the story of the house. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, um, but not part of the story that's associated with the right, I wanted characteristics that called out. Carve it out. Um, and then there's a pool bar also, which is a significant thing. And where does that stand uh, as far as, you know, that, that also could be um, eliminated? Well, once it's designated, they can't do anything to the exterior without coming to right, us. Right, correct. So it, then we have the. Right, and any work that would otherwise, that would 
be relatively routine kind of maintenance issues is typically uh, a lot of those are resolved at a staff level where staff is guided by the Secretary of Interior standards, mm -hmm. the expectations, the HPC. So some minor sort of work is fairly routinely approved by staff. Anything that's so significant as taking, removing the pool or replacing it or taking out a bathhouse or something like that would must certainly come to the HPC for your consideration and kind of review should that ever come forward. Okay. Um, so I hear the fountain and the awnings, um, and those were the two major issues that we would consider right. for further discussion. So we're now ready for a motion on the designation. So I'll make a motion. Okay. Staff would also like to get clarification on the name of oh, this property. Oh, right. We were going to mention that. Um, I had mentioned, but um, agreed. Would we agreed? Yes. So the it commission would be called the Stanford House. agrees yes. that Stanford House is appropriate. For the name. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'll make Mr. a motion. Shire. I'd like to recommend that the city council, or that the city council, approve the property at 804 West Kenneth Road to be designated as a historic resource on the Glendale Register of Historic Resources, and that it be named the Stanford House. I'd also like to recommend. Um, that the house is entered into a Mills Act contract and based or two things to consider as part of that contract would be that the awnings, the two metal awnings be either removed or replaced to match the existing canvas awnings that are on the house and that the uh, fountain be made functional within the two year duration um, of the Mills Act. Okay. Sounds good. Second? I'll second. Roll call. Commissioner Morgan? Yes. Commissioner Shire? Yes. Commissioner Tufankin? Yes. Commissioner Bartanya? Yes. And Chairperson Vidor? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you, oh. mm -hmm. Thank you very much Thank you. for Thank you. taking the time to come. I'm sorry for being so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. So we have no further issues to discuss. We've covered hmm. the whole thing. Very good. Good motion. So now we go on to 9B, which is uh, a discussion following up on one of our um, commission-generated proposals, the solar panel installation at designated properties. So I think that uh, Mr. Loomis is going to speak to us about that. Yes. Uh, you'll recall, I believe it was in your March meeting, uh, Mr. Platt handed out two kind of flyers that he had found, I think, literally that day or that week regarding solar panels on historic properties. Um, and I believe it was actually a now outgoing chairperson, uh, Mardian, who brought this issue up originally. That is, I think the concern, uh, as Mr. Mardian had raised it, was what sort of review possibilities are there should somebody want to install solar panels on historic properties, either designated properties or properties in historic districts. Um, this is a very brief report because basically the answer is you have no review. <laughs> yeah. um, despite the information that came out uh, that Jay provided, uh, which is from national organizations, um, the state of California has decided uh, and passed laws that say basically cities have essentially no discretionary jurisdiction over the placement of solar panels. Obviously, we can uh, have building permits, the kind of necessary public safety permits to ensure, and structural permits to ensure that solar panels, as they're installed on houses, are not going to cause leaks or fall off and hit people. Um, but uh, the state has said if you want to exercise a design review action on that, basically the state says, no, you cannot. Um, so that's, that applies everywhere, not just in historic districts. Um, I, so that's kind of the short version of it. Um, there is possibly some gray area uh, where um, through the Mills Act contract and potentially if the solar panel involves some elaborate structure to carry it um, and wasn't simply just put on the roof, um, that potentially there is a little bit of a gray area there where there could one could argue there is some discretionary design review and zoning uh, review, um, but it is a gray area, and unfortunately, the gray area in, in state law tends to be decided through appeals and court cases. So I'm not sure we want to be the case study <laughs> and uh, exercising where black turns to white in that gray area. 
Um, so that's kind of the, the short version of it. Um, that being said, I think anybody who owns a register property, should they decide or wish to put solar panels on that property, uh, one would hope would be fairly sensitive about how they would do it and would come visit the uh, historic preservation staff, design review staff, and planning staff uh, for some consultation. And obviously we would work with them within the boundaries of the law and sort of good cooperation to make sure that any solar panels installed on historic properties are done in a sort of sensitive and sensible manner. Um, so that's kind of the short version of the, the, the whole version of the report. Um, I can tell you thus far, as far as I'm aware, we haven't had any interest from anybody in historic properties interest in wanting to put solar panels on. Not properties. yet, anyway. Not yet, yeah. Um, but obviously, there very well could be in the near in, in the future, in mm -hmm. near future or distant future. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the short for the version of the report. If you're interested in the specific statutes of the state law and all that sort of stuff, I'd be happy to get that for you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Loomis? No. No. Okay. I I just have one quick one, and that is that I'm assuming here that if somebody was putting solar panels on their house, they would even though they wouldn't go through design review, that they would get a permit and that all the safety elements, including the weight of the material on a potentially sensitive old historic roof, would be judged by somebody uh, at the city so that nobody was imperiled by it. Absolutely, yeah. They, they do need to get a building permit. Um, but the right. typically building permits in Glendale first require design review sign-off. Mm -hmm. That's the part that they just get to bypass right. based on the state law. But they would have to get a building permit to make sure that the structure was sound enough to carry whatever load they would put up on the building. Okay. Well, you know, if somebody at some point gen want, is interested in this, when we do further education and outreach, we might want to revisit the topic. But until it becomes an issue, it's probably going to go to sleep now, <laughs> <laughs> unless anyone has anything else to add. Okay, let's move on then. So the next item is item number 10, uh, planning division update and inform informational briefings first on um, the status of the historic resource surveys for Ross Moyne, North Cumberland Heights, and Brockmont Park. Hey, once again, um, I want to note first of all that this is an update on the status of the historic resource surveys for these three historic districts. Uh, the commission is not taking any action. This is a right. simply informational item. So uh, even though uh, Commissioners Vartanian and Shire live within the proposed Rossmine Historic District for the time being, for this purpose you can stay on the dais. Although, Thank of course, you. at any time that the commission does actually review this formally, you will have to recuse yourself. Um, so, but you're not taking action at this time, um, so you're welcome to stay. Um, just as a reminder, we have three, uh, rather, could you go back to Ross Moyne? Um, we have three historic districts uh, that are three neighborhoods that have applied for historic district status uh, and are currently in the application process. So as a reminder, uh, the first is Ross Moyne, which is approximately 500 homes. Um, it, which this is the boundaries here in red um, from Ethel, uh, Mountain, uh, Ross Moyne, uh, uh, those streets with Nibley Park sort of dead in the center of it. Um, the proposed application, the proposed district corresponds almost ex uh, pretty much exactly with the original Ross Moyne subdivision as it was laid out and, and marketed and sold in the 1920s. Uh, with the exception that there is a small portion that was originally part of Ross Moyne that's on the south side of the Verdugo Wash uh, up against Glendale Avenue. That's not part of the historic, historic proposed district. Um, so we have approximately a little over 500 properties in the proposed Ross Moyne Historic District. Um, we have uh, North Cumberland Heights, which is the north portion of the original Cumberland Heights survey that was mentioned earlier. Uh, so here in this map, uh, the, uh, the properties that are colored is the area that's the North Cumberland Heights. I believe it's a little over 100 properties. Um, and then the dark outline is the ex uh, currently designated Argivine Highlands Historic District. And then the other properties to the south are, part, are properties that were surveyed as part of the, the Cumberland Heights survey, but are not part of the North Cumberland Heights Historic District. So we have this neighborhood is applied for historic district status. And then finally, 
uh, Brockmont Park, which is the area directly below the uh, designated Brockmont Clock Tower. It was property zoned by the Brockmont family, and then they subdivided that area and, and, and marketed it as Brockmont Park. It's a little smaller neighborhood. That neighborhood is also applied for historic district status. So just as a reminder of the three neighborhoods we have. Um, to go to the next one. So where these projects uh, or these three historic districts are in the status is summarized here in this famous chart that we keep showing of the public process involved in historic des designating neighborhoods historic districts. Um, the blue, light blue boxes indicate public hearings or public meetings. Uh, thus far we have, with the three neighborhoods, they've submitted their petitions and requests to be considered historic districts to the commission. You've approved those. And the next step of the process is to do the formal historic resources survey. So all three districts are now in that gray box that's highlighted in red, which is the um, process of staff and consultants doing the formal historic survey. Uh, Ross Moyne, uh, we've hired the firm LSA to perform the historic survey, and it was about two weeks ago. Uh, they gave us the first draft of the historic context statement, which is the sort of the story of Ross Moyne, if you will, it explains what what is the relevant history that kind of that tells the story of Ross Moyne and kind of and establishes the period of significance, which is the time frame in which that neighborhood was really kind of important. The historic uh, significance of that neighborhood is sort of the two dates, beginning and end, um, as one of the criteria used for determining um, contributing buildings to the district. So we received the first draft of that uh, statement about two weeks ago, and then last week. Um, we got the first draft of all their survey forms of all 504 properties. <laughs> so uh, we've got our work cut out for us as staff in terms of reviewing that work, uh, those forms. Um, so it's the furthest along, and I think we'll probably be completing our review of that at staff probably in the coming month, uh, refining that with the consultant, and then at that point, once we produce the um, what we consider a staff and consultant level final version of the context statement and historic surveys, those get distributed to residents of the proposed district. Uh, and then the next box on the chart is a um, neighborhood meeting in which people from the neighborhood are notified. They get an opportunity to review the documents, documentation, tell us, you know, what they like, what they don't like. If we've missed information, I suspect with Ross Moyne of 500 properties that there's probably a decent number of stories that are not readily evident from driving by the street or digging into the archives and that we may make some further revisions to the documentation based on that meeting. And then this next box down would be the survey comes to the Historic Commission for the Commission's uh, review. Uh, the commission at that time would then review and say, yes, this meets all the appropriate standards of historic scholarship and the city's standards. It appears that the neighborhood does meet the criteria, and at that point you would authorize the, um, the applicants to begin circulating for a petition re formally requesting the historic district overlay zone. So with Ross Moyne, I suspect probably July is about the soonest. I think the commission will have an opportunity to see that. Um, but certainly we'll let you know uh, when we have a community meeting, which might be early July, maybe. Probably sometime early July is when we'll have the next outreach meeting on that. Uh, North Cumberland Heights is a little bit, uh, be, uh, be, it's like one step behind Ross Moyne. In this case, we've, uh, as staff is working on the survey, um, because it had been previously surveyed for Cumberland Heights, we're sort of drafting off of the old Cumberland Heights survey, revisiting all those properties and updating the survey. Um, Christina, I believe we're about about 20% through that work. Um, so staff is doing all the legwork on that um, and revising the context statement as necessary. So that may be, you know, it's probably at least a month behind um, when you'd see that from the commission. And then Brockmont Park, uh, is really just getting started, I think, on our survey work. In this case, you'll recall that one of the applicants is actually qualified under the, the Secretary of Interior standards to perform to prepare the, the uh, context statement and the survey work. Um, so the applicant is working on that and see what their time frame is. That one's probably going to come in the fall, would be my guess, when we get that completed. I will say with both North Cumberland Heights and with Brockmont Park, um, we are also investigating um, what we need to do at a staff level to have peer review. 
part of the historic district ordinance asks for there to be an outside consultant that sort of surveys and understands the neighborhood and makes an ind essentially an independent assessment. So with North Cumberland Heights and Brockmont Park, since those are being done on one case by staff, the other case by uh, by the applicant, we do need to time figure in the timing for some form of professional peer review. Um, we're still sort of ascertaining exactly how to go about doing that, but I may or may not add a little extra time frame timeline to it. So that's the summary of where we're at. All three of them are in the same place, basically. Ross Moyne is probably the furthest ahead, but it's pretty exciting to have. Mm -hmm. 500 homes surveyed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, that is quite um, quite a lot of work you have on your plate. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments for Mr. Loomis? I uh, just want to say that, yes, and acknowledge that it's quite a lot of work, and thank you for all the, thanks staff for all the work on that. Um, I also wanted to ask, did you mention when you thought the, um, the DPRs, is that Right. would be mailed out to the residents in the proposed Ross Moyne district or? Right, with all three districts, when we have that the community meeting after staff has finalized the survey, for, the survey um, that's when the DPR forms will go out. So okay. uh, what we'll end up doing is mailing the DPR forms, say you own property X, you'll get the DPR form for property X plus a context statement or information about how to access that online. Obviously, we're not going to email all 500 forms out to every resident that would be in Ross Moyne or the other districts. So they'll just, owners of property will just get the DPR forms for their pro the property that they own, or properties, as the case may be. Uh, I have a question. I, I don't remember with, with the first three districts the peer review thing. Could you just describe yeah. who does peer review and was that done before? It was not done before because with the previous three districts we had hired a consultant to do the survey work. Oh, I see. So that was the that was the case. And with Ross Moyne we won't be investigating peer review because uh, we have an independent consultant who's doing the survey work. But because we're doing the survey work in-house or with an applicant, we think that we probably need to have a peer review. So we may end up contracting with one of the historic consultants to just sort of take a look at our report and kind of tell us, did we do it right or not, and give us a letter that says that mm -hmm. to that effect. See. Um, the other where we are investigating is, as it turns out, that when we submit all this information, it does go up to the State Preservation, his Office of Historic Preservation, SHPO, um, and it's possible that SHPO's review of it may constitute a peer review. Oh. So that may be Which significant. Would be convenient. Yeah, it would be very convenient and save us Most a little effective. bit of money. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay, we could move on to 10B, which is another report on um, additional conditions for the uh, 304 South Central Mills Act contract. Yes. Um, you'll recall 304 South Central is, uh, you saw at your last meeting, it's the. Um, Central Storage Tower, um, uh, just below Colorado. Uh, both this and the other Proc, uh, the, the other Fleming House, designed by, commissioned by Proc, went to the council uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, both of them, the council voted in favor of designation with the Mills Act contracts. Um, the Central Storage Building was an interesting case where the commission at, or the council added an extra condition to the Mills Act that the commission didn't consider and that is to replace the storefront windows that are on the ground floor facing central uh, with more appropriate windows. Right now there's some form of aluminum frame windows. They're obviously not original mm -hmm. and the council sort of decided that replacing those windows with wood frame windows more appropriate to the building, uh, metal sash windows is something that they wanted to add. So it's an interesting case that hasn't happened as far as I know where uh, I've been working with the commission where the council has added additional considerations. I think they did that with um, Casa de Carmen too, so maybe yes. we yeah, should did. trade yeah. places with the council. <laughs> I, I would recommend that the commission did watch this. I would recommend actually that all the commissioners watch the discussion on, South Cent on the uh, South Central Storage Building property. Um, okay. The council had a very animated discussion about it with at least one of the council members voting in, uh, against the designations so of saying it didn't think it rose to the, the sort of status that the mm -hmm. building had been altered in too many occasions. So it's, it's typically when the council ultimately hears 
designation cases, they tend to enjoy the slides and the story with the property and go with the commission without too much mm -hmm. discussion about additional items. But this was one where they did. Mm -hmm. After a very long meeting, I might add, too. Wow. So. Well, I'm glad they're really interested in So, but the building was designated with an extra condition into the Mills Act. So. Okay. Thank you for the update. So if there's nothing else to discuss, I will make a motion, which we don't have to vote on, to adjourn the meeting in memory of the king of <laughs> Googie architecture, Eldon Davis. This is the book, Googie Redux, which features his work. So... Mr. Davis, thank you for all Actually, the wonderful things you've done. For Mr. Gore, I, I think as chair, you're not. A, you cannot make a motion to adjourn. I think one of your commissioners will have to. Oh, okay. So I have to ask motion. for a motion, and then we just go. All right. Then well, you get a second, and we're. Done. I'll do that. Who wants to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? I make a mo everybody. <laughs> second. Okay. We're adjourned. Michael first. <laughs> Svartanya in second. We're adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. And please note the uh, slide on the uh